So thank you very much for agreeing to chat with me today in your lovely office. We've had a few nice conversations on park benches in the botanical garden and um, occasionally elsewhere. And it's nice just to have a concerted conversation that we can share with other people. Thank you, Tess. You're very welcome. So I thought I'd start with a sort of initial question just to get us going, which is, what is it that has motivated you to teach and to do work around conceptions of the so-called non-traditional student in higher education? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was sort of thinking about this, and I suppose, like many things, you know, it, it, the roots of it are, are sort of in yourself. And, um, and, and in many ways, I was a non-traditional student. I didn't come from a privileged middle-class background. Um, and uh, so I suppose maybe um, there was always that slight sense of uh, being thrilled and delighted to be in a, in a university, even in the school was quite good. Um, but, but also to some extent, you know, a, a sense that th this is both your world and not your world. So a kind mm. of uh, push and pull. Um, and I suppose my first teaching, my very, very first teaching was in West Belfast in St. Genevieve's and I, I had to do some teaching there and hand lotion. And uh, the young ladies who I was teaching, the, what I was teaching them was um, mother care, a subject about which I knew absolutely nothing. So, so what I did, because I was terrified, I think, was to say, well, you tell me about mother care. And so I kind of flipped the whole thing around. And maybe that was an instinct to think that actually people do have all sorts of knowledges and all sorts of experience. Uh, and, and maybe what education is about is not so much telling people didactically, but releasing what's there in, in them as well. So then uh, the next teaching gig was in Canada when I, when I was a postgraduate student, doctoral student in Toronto. And I suppose the thing that struck me, I mean, I was been about 22 or 23 at the time, and most of the students uh, were older or looked older than I did at the time. And a lot of them were amateur students. So the whole idea of this concept of, of the non-traditional undergraduate, you know, was already established in places like, like Canada in the 80s when I, when I went out there in the 1970s. And so um, I had to think about how I modelled teaching. And, and I suppose I started to model that quite early because they, there was no point in going in there and and teaching literature and talking about Shakespeare and Swift and everything else because they didn't have a literary background. That was the other thing. They weren't necessarily literature majors. So it was about how can I make this teaching relevant or how, how can I communicate, I suppose, at the most basic level. So so what was, I started to do was watch TV and things like the, the White Shadow. And then I was able to explain how, how episodic structure worked in a medieval tale like Gawain. <laughs> Um, and I also encouraged them to, uh, to do things like write poetry or songs or things like that. So when we were doing sonnets, you know, well, we could, we could, we could do a song there. Uh, and some of them were very musical and that kind of appealed to them. Um, and I suppose that was kind of a, a form of rap in its own way. And then we would have an odd concert and, and a friend would bring a guitar and we'd, we'd go in and sing and, and talk nonsense. So. It was about that kind of a sense of understanding instead of getting frustrated with what students didn't know. And, and why don't they understand Shakespeare? And why haven't they read Swift? Uh, they're so ignorant. Uh, you know, taking that kind of almost sort of very colonialist uh, view of the students, which I certainly did hear articulated. I thought it was better to try and see, well, what, what is it that they are into? What is their other light beyond the classroom? And I suppose I kept that going. So, so when I, I was then out of uh, academia for many years and worked in community development and um, with, with people on, uh, you know, who, who had been long term unemployed and stuff like that, and in, in community development and rural development. And so I started to think again about how we could do something that would appeal to what people's strengths were. And uh, so that there had basically two, the three divisions in this uh, uh, government scheme. So one was people who did gardens, and one was people who did wallpapering and painting. 
and then it was us. And that had the people who didn't do painting and didn't do gardens. Yeah. And that was the communication section. So what was there was a lot of musicians and there, there was a kind of a wee nasket musicians collective and different things going on with the, with the, the people there. And so I said, well, well, why don't we, and a couple of graphic people who had been graphic artists, so why don't we do something that taps into those skills? So we started making books. And we got a grant from the Arts Council, which was the very first grant uh, outside Belfast and Derry. Um, and we bought ourselves an Apple computer, which was, I mean, an absolute luxury at that time. And so, and we did oral history and we did all sorts of things, but, but all the time what they had to do was create high production values. But there were, there were research and stuff that was relevant and interest, and they were able to um, also kind of bring in the skills they already had. The, I suppose the other thing was, in terms of structure, that, that you know, organisations tend to want you to be very uh, rigid in terms of timetable and where, where people are supposed to be at any particular time of the year. And I'm sure I get into trouble with my bosses, uh, but I knew that as long as I got the work done, it was better to work in their rhythm and, and not worry too much about them having to be somewhere at nine o'clock in the morning. So I then worked in community arts for a number of years. and. Again, not uh, and disability arts and things like that, and that gave me a lot of understanding of uh, um, how people could, could uh, you know, wor work on the, the strengths and skills that they had, and how people were actually beginning to think of themselves as little weak communities. And I mean, that was quite a new thing in Northern Ireland, and was like another way of thinking on top of people thinking about uh, parishes or townlands or or you know turf areas in Belfast where you know people don't sort of make any connection uh, across um, and then eventually um, and I did, did a number of projects in, in rural development using arts and again starting to think of those not just as as projects but thinking about what the learning could be how, how you could enskill people so within community development, you talk about training, mm -hmm. and I suppose within education, you talk about education, but it's basically the same process. It's about empowering people. And so at that point, I hadn't really, if you like, theorized any of this very much, although I had been starting to think, read a good bit about community development, and particularly people like Freire and, and those sorts of uh, uh, actors and thinkers who who sort of crossed between notions of civic uh, uh, empowerment and, and uh, uh, people being active citizens and things like that, but also the notion of the importance of education transformation. Uh, and, and, you know, education is power, I suppose, which kind of made a lot of sense to, to somebody from, like this app from, you know, that kind of not very well off background. When the began Queens, which was in December 95, and at that time, uh, it was the Armagh campus. It was a little outreach campus. And I suppose because I had a community development background, the job that I had in Queen's was kind of developmental job, which was very unusual in Queen's at that time. So while in community development and rural development, you would have had people doing that kind of uh, grassroots work, working with different kinds of community groups and things like that, it was very unusual in academia. Uh, and so, so I started to build up different kinds of networks with different groups, women's groups, uh, disability groups, different kind, uh, local history groups, and started to begin to think about how we could tailor uh, educational opportunities uh, for what people needed and wanted, rather than, well, well you know, as it were, uh, bringing the Ark of the Covenant. You know, so, so you know, building a program that, that suited that community and that was relevant and had meaningful. And really that came out of community development. So even when I was working in rural development and community development, I, I found myself doing things uh, through art space projects. And you know, that might be ultimately because I see the world through through arts, you know, th through that kind of lens. That's, that's how I see and hear the world. That's how I apprehend it. Um, 
Uh, but it was also that it was noticeable that people really enjoyed doing things through the art. So, you know, there, there's a wonderful critic who talks about artful behaviour, you know, that people can tend towards that when they can get a chance at all. Uh, and I think there's something in that. Um, so, so um, over the years in our man, I mean, I was there several years, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, and we did... So Armagh became a kind of observatory, it became a kind of seedbed for all sorts of, um, if you like, education in the community. So it was an outreach campus, uh, and then I outreached the outreach campus, I could put it that way. So I started to do cross-border projects because Armagh is about 20 miles or so from the border with the Irish Republic, and so we started to do cross-border things. Uh, around areas um, like mental health, uh, uh, empowering carers, um, and and uh, and uh, community development, uh, arts development, ha how you set up arts projects in the community, and so we had like short little courses, then we had longer courses, but and then we had certificate level courses that we grew out of some of those other courses, so. Many of the people who came along had very few qualifications of any sort. H had left school either because of economic circumstance or because they found school a very alienating sort of environment, very um, uncommodious. Uh, and here they were as adult learners. So, of course, you, you did things in a different way. So, so there's that sense of the importance of learning having meaning for the learner. And people are not going to commit to it unless it, it has some meaning and relevance. But so because of that community development kind of headspace, we started to think about, if you like, the, the, the tricky issues, the big issues, things like mental health, um, uh, and then later projects around things like male identity, things like uh, identity of disabled people. Uh, and and so we we worked with a number of groups in the community, and and a lot of it just kind of became art based because that's the shape that people want to use. So for example, we did a project with men from South Armagh on uh, raising awareness and consciousness about mental health in, among men, which of course is a notoriously difficult uh, thing to do, and they decided. Uh, that they wouldn't do a little leaflet on it because they, could, that wasn't, they wouldn't read that themselves. Mm. And then it's okay, we'll do a film. And they liked the idea of doing a film because there was, uh, they could use booms and big boys' toys. So as Golding says, it's all about hands-on learning and men, men that appeals to them. You see that in the whole kind of men's shed, uh, movement and stuff. So, um, and also that men find it very difficult to talk. So what we did was not only to have a film which was a hands-on thing, but a film that wasn't a documentary, but a Mickey Up story. Mm. And of course, people in South Armagh are famous for being terrific storytellers. And there's a lot of music uh, uh, in that area as well. Um, and a lot of people with visual arts talents, photographers and things. So again, we brought that all, uh, brought that all in and, and in a sense created a meta project where the, they photographed themselves, photograph them, and they photographed themselves making the film. Um, and that sort of then started to begin to become the basis of how you theorized that or, you know, evaluated it. But when I did a lot of those projects, I didn't, I hadn't, re I hadn't really the theory, if you know what I mean. I had community development theory, but it didn't really have uh, educational theory. That, that really came sort of afterwards. When, when I went to think about how would I publish research about any of this. So I don't know if that's the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it, but that's the way I did it. And I have to be honest about that, that I didn't have um, an a priori theory and then, uh, you know, created a project to test that theory. It was the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very gratifying to, to, to realise that there were there was a body of, um, research around, uh, you know, g g kind of qualitative research, but but more particularly about arts-based type of, uh, research. So that was very encouraging. Uh, but we also, in a way, we built one project out of another. And I suppose the key features 
in each case uh, was partnership. So the partnership was between the university and uh, maybe a number of local community organisations, but also with organisations like the Nerve Centre, who, who are based in Derry and now Belfast, who are leading edge in what we might call creative digital literacy mm -hmm. training. So that opened a whole new world for me about arts-based stuff that you could do using, uh, using technology using different forms of technology and multimedia technology. So we, and I suppose the other feature was that because we had this partnership with different grassroots organisations, we were able to then work with them to create funding applications to organisations like the Arts Council and the Lottery and also to uh, the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland which, uh, which I had worked for as a, as a community arts officer several years before. Uh, and so they, they had a whole bunch of money for doing you know, digitally things, IT-based uh, things. But again, a lot of those ended up being shaped as, as arts-based type projects. And I think again and again, this is what people enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. um, and and which brought out the best in them because they had a lot of those latent skills anyway. Um, and so over the years we did loads and loads and loads of these projects and then um, it came up to Belfast because the, the campus in Armagh closed down and did some more work particularly in areas like peace building and leadership and those sorts of things. But So the scene up here in Belfast was, was kind of a different scene mm. in many respects but nonetheless uh, so you know, that work continued and uh, we, we did some more arts based stuff uh, when I was up here. And I suppose the other thing from a pedagogic point of view about adult learning, to get it back to that, um, was, and again I suppose this has its, its anchorage or its roots in, in a kind of Freirean or community development approach, and that was about empowering the learner. So out of that you start to get things like the co-construction of the curriculum. You know, what what you learn is well what's what's relevant for you to learn? What do you what is need to learn? What do you want to learn? Um, uh, and also then because a lot of the projects were not just learning projects but action research projects, um, we began to de develop uh, among the learners skills in research. Uh, and they also became co-designers. So instead of it being a kind of a top-down or academically imposed project, people that was generated in a different sort of way. And so people uh, stuck with it because it wasn't for something. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just oh well, all these academics with fancy accents running about uh, around rural areas, you know, telling the, the locals and looking down their nose and making subjects of them. I mean, they had, they've, we've had quite enough. Uh, uh, um, postures of that description uh, perhaps in this country so we don't really need any more of that um, uh, and, and in each case there was also a learning product a legacy, a film a, a play a, a practitioner's toolkit a, a claymation wh wh whatever it might be wh which was sort of of direct benefit to that community so there was a kind of a legacy of learning and what also happened was, and we find this generally with the open learners, is that the people get a bug for it. <laughs> and that sort of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about passporting learning. So <laughs> we, had, we had kind of a hard core of people who, who, went, who, who joined with us on a whole range of different projects. And that core group would be like, uh, they just got a, a, a love for the learning and they just wanted to keep on doing more of it, you know. Mm. Um, and that would be a feature of our open learning, our mainstream, if you like, open learning program here. But the other thing for non-traditional learners that's extremely important, and I mean this will be worn out by research, you know, by all sorts of people, particularly in areas where, um, where adult learning is very strong, like Canada and Australia, uh, that that you'll get this, the whole sense of passport and learning. So people have missed out for whatever reason on um, kind of traditional learning. And 
so it's very important that that they have the opportunity. There, you don't force them, but you give them the opportunity to have that learning accredited. So what we were able to do was bring in people with no qualifications whatsoever. That, and again, that would you know go back to a time in rural Northern Ireland where a lot of people of my generation uh, there wouldn't have been a second level. There would have been a second level, but only a grammar school. So if mm. you didn't pass the eleven plus exam, you couldn't get into that school. So you you just kept on in primary school effectively until you were fourteen, and then you went you went out, and you had no qualifications. And um, it wasn't anything to do with pe people not being bright enough. The the, yeah. the infrastructure, if you like, wasn't there in education. So. So this allowed them to start to get qualifications, and then a number of them, who started off on the short uh, open learning, some of them turned out to be quite long programs, 20, 40 weeks, uh, then were able to progress onto certificates, and we designed a whole range of certificates to meet what they need. So there would have been certificates in arts in the community, local history, uh, community development, uh, peace building, uh, assistive technology which was a was a big big need for for again we're back with our IT here again mm. but also the, the the whole kind of disability agenda and the notion of independence and so on um, and then people could use those certificates to come on to BA part-time BA programs and there, I suppose I mean there are many people who I can think of in the head who, who went through that process and one fellow in particular who, who had very um, challenging um, handicaps, um, and I'm using language here in a very particular way, so he had very challenging impairments. And we got him, and he had really missed out in school. And so he started off just doing little short courses. We got him then onto certificates. We got him then onto BA, uh, and he then went to Dublin and did his masters. And he's now working as a disability officer. Uh, and but I mean that kind of raises maybe the other thing that I wanted to talk about, which was you know doing work with adult uh, uh, adults is also about not just a particular kind of pedagogy. But also, how do you how do you build the support systems? So, the reasons why people have missed out in education are often very complex. But one of them, very often, is that they couldn't afford it. Mm. Okay, so they're they're not doing stuff because they couldn't afford to do stuff. So the first thing is, uh, how do you make this free for them, or how do you get grants out of somewhere to, to make it accessible in that way? Maybe they have the money, or their husband or their wife has the money, but they haven't transport because maybe they're on a farm and there's only one car. Or maybe they are, ha, uh, live with a disability and there's no accessible transport. Or maybe they live with disability and they need a note taker. Or maybe they live with disability, like, like the student, and uh, it's deteriorated physically. Uh, and so they need uh, elaborate assistive technology that can be bolted on to a wheelchair. So it's thinking about all those levels of access, structural yes. in terms of economics, yes. or also um, in terms of a program providing structures that yes. incremental that can allow That's people right. in, and the provide the uh, you know access to things like uh, disability uh, DSA disability student allowance, uh, but also that provide wraparound systems like pastoral care systems, but also uh, the note taker or uh, the, the woman who comes along with a hoist so that the person who, who, who needs to, to uh, have that during the day can have it or whatever it might be. Sure, so sure. It, that's, we would ring fence part of our budget so that those services could be provided on an individual tailored basis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that was one of the keys to it. Mm -hmm. that, and that, that this was not about, oh well we'll give you a lock of power. Uh, sorry, that's maybe a very dialect way of putting it. Let me put it into more standard English. Just say it again. Give you a, a lock of pound. A lock, a lock of pound. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. A few, a few quid, a, a small amount of money. Uh, 
uh, and we'll give that to you, you know, in a kind of philanthropic way. This was about meeting people's needs on their own terms. Mm. So mm. they identified the needs, uh, not the other way around. Mm. And that's the principle of, of the disability service here, which yeah. I have to, to set up. Yeah, that's great. So um, I just want to, um, we're so pressed for time. Mm -hmm. This has been amazing because you've touched on so many aspects of really important things that one needs to consider, but also just given us such a grounded sense of where your own knowledge and wisdom has come from really now. Um, I want to ask you a question about the importance really of thinking about ways of mainstreaming your knowledge that you have. I know that you're you teach in a course for academics who are coming in, or teaching staff who are coming into a university in the UK, and who are either new to the university environment or just new to that university. And you're given an opportunity, in a sense, to um, question some of the thinking that they might have about the students. That mm -hmm. why, why do you think that is important, questioning ideas of how we construct the students? Um, well. Uh, I think because uh, for all that, that some of the opportunities uh, are not there, that, that we're there, uh, we do have a much more diverse student population and maybe that's a result of mainstreaming in areas like setting up disability services so that uh, people who, who you know 20 years ago couldn't have got near a university physically <laughs> uh, or in any other way uh, can now go, but we have, and the other thing that makes it very diverse uh, and brilliantly diverse uh, is that people are coming from all sorts of different cultures. So again, I suppose having lived in, in places like Canada and because as advisor of studies, I have a lot of contact with international students um, and the challenges that, that they have, um, which are different and, 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 you know, very, very tough at times. And and part of it is about those cultural sorts of differences. And it kind of echoes back to what I said earlier about people can feel a sense of alienation um, and, and intimidation in a situation. So it's about entering the learner zone. And, and that's what I keep coming back to. So in, when I'm uh, teaching the teachers, if you put it like that, I suppose there's two things that, that I would be trying to get them to think about. You know, one is, how was it for you? What challenges did you face as a student? Can you put yourself into the position of a student? Uh, and bearing in mind that, that because you're sitting here in Queen's University as an academic, you're probably you know, within the top four or five in, in your class, uh, wherever that class was, uh, India or Germany or, or South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, you know, you're not the C student, you're not the, the student who's struggling academically, and you might not even be been the student who was struggling in other ways, but maybe you had your own struggles. And who listened to you? You know, uh, who, who made it easier for you? Who didn't? So once the start, and I mean, I just do this sometimes, <laughs> it's a simple exercise where I get them to, bit like, sort of like confession time, and, and I say, well, how... Uh, what what do you think the ideal student is like? And then, you know, what kind of student were you? <laughs> and it begins to become obvious that, you know, no, nobody is an ideal student. Um, and so it, it's about always thinking about things from the student's point of view as well. And, and how do you get all this brilliant learning that you have? How do you communicate that? You yeah. Know? Yeah. In, in terms of the students, uh, can can find uh, an accommodation for identify with it, you know, rather than well this is it and just take it or leave it, mm. which is a very arch hierarchical, uh, and I suppose I'm not mad about that in terms of power relations that that creates, you know. Uh, so that I'm much keener on the idea of the teacher as facilitator, mm. and I suppose that goes right back to. That those early early days, you know, yeah. when you 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 do the, as it were a flipped teacher, and you say, well, what do, what do you boys know? Yeah, you tell me. Yeah, at, you know what great qualities of mother care. You know what they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, I think 
you probably um, have been privileged in some ways mm -hmm. because you were in a position right from the beginning where your um, your students were not constructed as students. They were people in front of you with a number of uh, a wealth of, of knowledge and a number of challenges, and the challenge mm -hmm. was all grounded. While often in formal education, what we're doing is holding a body of knowledge that we see as authoritative and seeing ourselves as brokers within that. And that sometimes mm -hmm. impedes the recognition that we're people and we have knowledge on either side. But what I wanted to, to ask is, um, you've been in and engaging with people around the issues, complex issues in their lives for a long period of time. Um, now you're, you use a lot of literature and art, you always have, as a sort of third text to engage with them. But um, sitting as you are in this position now, what do you think are the areas, whether it's in terms of our teaching practice or our research or our community engagement, that, that where there's space still to grow? So if somebody listening to this is thinking, where are areas either to grow or problems that are, are that we need to address? Well, gosh, I mean, you could spend all day talking about the problems that need to be addressed. <laughs> and, and I suppose those have to do with, with the whole zeitgeist and, and what has come to be seen as a purpose of universities. Mm. Um, Would you like to talk about that a little well, bit? Well, maybe. I think that's at the heart of the issue, right? Yes, I mean, it, yes, for me, you know, I mean, the, the chance to actually get to university was so amazing. Um, and so I suppose I never took that for granted. But I also was enculturated even at school, even though there were many things I didn't like about um, school. But there was always that sense that you were there in the world to try and do some good for somebody else and not just yourself. So there was always a challenge to that kind of very uh, individualistic, mm -hmm. privatised notion of knowledge. Uh, and that knowledge was there as, as a social thing to, and, and that was somehow in some way about the betterment of society. And, you know, in, in some ways that sounds almost quaint nowadays. Uh, that why would you bother with something so, um, so cute as that, you know, when you're well, about not. Money. That is why um, many of us are here. Uh, so, so I suppose that, that was there. It was also so fantastic to have a couple of years, you know, four years where you weren't breaking your back, uh, working, uh, to just think and play with ideas. And so that notion of the university as somehow civilizing or to do with self-actualization or whatever way you want to put that, that's very important. And, and that, a, that a knowledge doesn't always have to be utilitarian. It doesn't always have to be you know, completely pragmatic. And it can be to do with how you become more enriched in how you see the world and what you see. And instead of just seeing the surface, that you see more deeply, I suppose, and apprehend and listen more deeply. And so that creates a kind of quietness, but it also creates a sort of richness. So I suppose we we'll have those three purposes, you know, the idea that yes, you go to university to try and get some sort of a decent job at the end of it. Uh, you, you go for some kind of personal fulfillment. Uh, but you also go, it seems to me, or you ought to, or the mission of the university. And it's always articulated rhetorically uh, that, you know, we, we need to give something back, that we're, that we're out there uh, with our degrees or whatever we might have. Uh, but, but, you know, how do we make that a stronger imperative all the way through education uh, rather than encouraging uh, or, or not questioning? Uh, you know, a very competitive, individualistic, uh, contractual, neoliberal commodification of education. You know, how do each of us challenge that? And there may be things that are very good about that as well. Uh, but, but I suppose, you know, I think it, it's the knowledge is power, and knowledge is about us doing something to try and tackle inequality because we are the privileged ones. You are so right. Mm. And do we just use that to advance ourselves? Or is there some sense in which there's a more uh, global purpose, a more uh, an ethical purpose in some sense? Mm. Um, 
And if we don't put that into students, if we don't show by example, then how, how are they going to ever um, absorb that kind of value if it's, if, it, if it's so hidden, if it's so salient? Do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we're, we're not preachers. You know, if we, if we wanted to be preachers, we'd go across and, and train as preachers, wouldn't we? So, it, it, but nonetheless, I do think that, that by inculcating um, awareness of things like power relationships, awareness of the good that people can do, awareness of how we need to be compassionate and kindly and supportive of one another, um, and how we can think of doing things in more creative ways, using the arts, and how, God help us, we actually could enjoy our education instead of it just being, um, you know, uh, like, um, what is that song, Leonard Cohen, I'm just a station on your way, you know, that, that mm -hmm. right, we'll just like shove this down our throat and regurgitate it, and really life only begins proper life when you're, you're uh, sitting in the cocktail bar. Or employed. Right, you know, yeah. uh, presumably, because yeah. you've been employed. Uh, so, you know, it, at the most fundamental level, we work in an area called humanities. Well, I take it to be it's not called that for nothing. I, I take it to be that's not illiterate. Um, so the most important thing of all is how the universities humanize us and how we humanize ourselves and become a force for for that kind of humanizing ethos rather than uh, for individualism, for competition, for uh, exclusion. Thank you. Um, the last question I want you to ask, there may be people listening to this from a completely different context who won't get the opportunity to interact with you one-to-one, -one, which is the joy of technology, right? They get to have a bit of space in the intimacy of our discussion. Um, what sort of areas are you wanting to move into or do so that people who might be interested could perhaps contact you? Okay. Well, there, there's a number of things uh, that, that are in what's left of my brain at the minute. And one of them I, I've spoken to you about, Dina, which, which is... Uh, this project that I want to do with a, a range of uh, people with, who have migrant a migrant experience of one sort or another, and actually using the arts, particularly literature, uh, to, for them to see uh, how artists have have as it were inscribed or written their experience, and you know uh, how that can be actually very ratifying and, and healing, but also that they can they can speak back to that. And, and it's, it's a way of trying to challenge the idea of a very negative, um, uh, monolithic notion and, and of what a migrant is. So, so I call it Once Alien Here, which is um, a, a, a title of a poem by a, a man from Ulster called John Hughes. And, and, you know, we were all once alien here. And so, but people easily forget that. So that's, that's one thing I'm quite keen on. The other thing that I'm quite keen on is developing notions of, if you like, interculturality and interreading. So one thing I'm going to kind of, I'd love anybody to respond on this one. Uh, let's take, for example, um, a novel like um, Shamsi's, uh, Camilla Shamsi's Home Fire, or Raman's, uh, in the light of what we know. And, and inexorably, I would read those novels as a white uh, person from uh, Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. But somebody reading that novel in Pakistan or India will have a different perspective. So what I want to do is, and I'm going to try this out uh, this year, uh, is, is to actually have, have those different interpretations of the same novel from different cultural perspectives. Uh, being voiced, if you like, within within uh, using technology, yes. and then maybe uh, using that as a basis for a little bit of research or something like that. But what I'm interested in is uh, polyvalence and multivocal uh, apprehensions, because I suppose that's what art does. 
and that's why it's worth uh, talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to see what happens when we interweave. By the same token, uh, if I have an Indian partner and I get the Indian partner to read uh, a, a James Joyce's Ulysses or, uh, or a poem by Seamus Heaney, you know, what, how, what are they apprehending from that? So again, it's this notion of what is discovered in relation to, if you like, the other. And in what way are we alien? And, and you know, always thinking, people always think in, when they're in a power position that it's the, the, the other person who's alien and subject. They never think of themselves like that. So in the same way, they talk about, God, you have a, you have a very strong accent. But they don't <laughs> think that they have an accent themselves. So, you know, I'm very conscious as this would go out online that somebody's sitting in Cork, never mind um, Johannesburg or uh, Saskatchewan. You know, because what is that woman saying? You know, she has a really strong accent. <laughs> so, you know, we always have to think what is it that we're assuming? Do you know? And there's a lovely little exchange, we'll just to conclude that, uh, in, in a novel by Kate Grenville, uh, which I taught on Monday called The Secret River. And I teach world literature, so that's another way of doing it, teaching literatures from all over uh, and different cultures. But being very aware that there's things I'm not going to get, because I don't have that kind of cultural nuance, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, but it's still really, really wonderful to do those novels. You were saying there's a moment in that novel. So there's a, a moment where there, there's, uh, there's a character called Blackwood and uh, and he's a kind of, uh, unlike any of the other white uh, convict settlers, uh, because all of the convict settlers uh, take it to be that it is, a, a, it, when they discover that it's not a terra nullis, an, an empty land, the, the assumption is that they should control it. Whereas, and, and that they should take what they need, they should simply take it by force, um, if need be. Uh, whereas Blackwood says, they gave me a little. They gave me, or they let me have it. So he's the only figure in the novel who realises that uh, he is the intruder. Of course, it, uh, you know, mm. there's no way that that kind of uh, project can, can uh, end in, in uh, hilarity. Uh, but it, even historically, the re-examination of these things is worthwhile. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tess. Yes. <laughs> this was very, very <laughs> helpful, and it was nice just to have a moment to sit together. Thank you.